you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasound some hearts, some lungs, some IVCs, let us know how you feel about it. He you know, got his wrist pain by, by doing over-aggressive high fives to his buddies. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Testicle Month here at the Ultrasound Podcast. Now, last episode, we ended by showing you how to actually scan the testicle, the acute scrotum. And we're going to start off this time by showing you that clip again. Then we're going to jump right in and talk about this spectral Doppler stuff. And we're going to give you then some concrete examples of how you can actually use this in your clinical practice to make a difference on your next shift. Well, maybe not your next shift, but the next shift where you see someone with a painful swollen testicle. So, roll the footage. So, with ultrasound of the testicles, it's the same as any ultrasound modality. You're going to have a system. You want to do it the same way every time so you're consistent and don't miss anything. So, we're going to demonstrate on the model here. Uh, we tried to find a lifelike model, but all we had for these miniature ones, so we'll have to demonstrate on that. So, the first thing, as we mentioned, is patient positioning. You want to take the penis, fold it up onto the abdomen, the chest, uh, throw it over the shoulder, whatever you need to do. Get it out of the way, put a towel over it. Then when you're scanning, you place the probe on the testicle, you want to start with the unaffected side. Uh, you want to see what the normal testicle looks like first. You're going to start in the longitudinal plane with the probe marker up. So remember the epididymis is posterior lateral, so when you have the probe in this position, on the ultrasound screen it's going to be on the left of the screen because you have your probe marker towards the head and it's going to be on the bottom part of the screen, inferior. So once you've located that and scanned through that completely, you're also scanning through the testicle in this plane, then you're going to want to turn 90 degrees and scan completely through in this axis. After you've scanned through in B mode, you're going to want to turn the color on. You're on the good testicle here, so you're going to adjust the color until you just have color flow in the testicle. You're going to use this to compare it to the other side to make sure there's good flow. So after you're done on that side and you've got the color adjusted, you're going to move to the affected side, the painful side. Uh, the same orientation, longitudinal first. Take a look at the epididymis and see what the color flow is like in the epididymis compared to the other one. You're going to scan through the same way, completely through. You're going to scan through in the other plane, in the axial plane, uh, completely through. If you're having trouble finding flow in the testicle, um, especially on the good testicle, you may want to use the power Doppler button. Uh, if you hit that, you're going to get the, an image similar to this, and it helps pick up slow flow. It doesn't give you any information on direction, but you don't really care when you're looking at the testicles. You just want to know if there's flow or not. Uh, and then you're going to turn the color on at that point if it's not on with the same settings you had on the good side and compare the flow. Obviously, increased flow is you're thinking orchitis or epididymitis, and decreased flow you're thinking probably torsion. Also, after you've done all that, it's very helpful a lot of times if you can kind of Squeeze the testicles together, uh, get both of the testicles in the field of view at the same time under the probe. If you have this, you're able to directly compare the color of both at the same time. You're able to expand the color box and get it on both testicles. This can be really helpful. So we're going to tell you a little bit about spectral Doppler as well. So after you've evaluated for color flow in general, you may or may not want to use some spectral Doppler. If you do, Here's how you do that. You're going to place the probe on the testicle. You're going to find an area of blood flow. And once you do, to do spectral Doppler, you're going to use the pulse wave button on the machine. You're going to uh, hit the pulse wave, get the gate right over an area of flow, and then hit the pulse wave button again. And you're going to get a waveform and be able to tell if it's venous or arterial. With testicular torsion frequently, the venous uh, blood flow will disappear first. So you really want to have venous and arterial flow to completely rule out testicular torsion. So that's how you do it. We showed you this spectral Doppler thing. Um, let's talk really quickly about that. This is the more advanced part. If it wasn't for this, then testicular scanning would be really easy and something that we could all do for sure, no questions asked. The problem is occasionally you'll get a patient who they have an early testicular torsion and what happens is with that twisting you get decreased venous flow first uh, and then later the arterial flow. So you could actually have flow in a testicle and it's early and you would miss that patient if you didn't do spectral Doppler. That scares me. So so you can have flow in the testicle but you're still looking at a patient with torsion. Po yes, possibly. Now the way that we try to kind of alleviate that is with spectral Doppler once we have color, a color window with good color flow we pull up our pulse wave put the gate in a 
kind of flow area and we look for both arterial flow which you kind of see here with the uh, with the nice uh, biphasic waveform there and then you also want to identify some areas where there is venous flow too which is just more of kind of a flat um, steady constant flow pattern and if you can't identify that then that's a patient that may have a testicular torsion early. So one one second, Matt, can you go back to that last spectral Doppler? So are we looking at arterial or venous flow here? We're looking at arterial. It, it actually, um, you do have a low resistance arterial pattern in the testicle and this is actually not as high of a peak as the other pictures I've seen or that I've gotten before, but I think it's probably just related to the gain that they have turned up or down there. But that is a arterial that's an arterial flow. flow. So if it's a flat line, it's more of a venous flow. If it's got those peaks to it, it's more of an arterial flow. Exactly. Okay. Yes. So this kind of illustrates that point a little bit. This is a hospital. They did 20 years looking back at all their acute scrotums. And what they found in 1,300 patients, we talked about this number, about 9 or 10% had torsion earlier when we were talking about the emergency physician performed study. And not, but they did have nine cases of torsion that had normal or increased flow. So these are the patients that we're talking about that theoretically, hopefully, we may be able to pick up with the spectral Doppler. Still pretty good sensitivity, 92%, just for flow, just if it's decreased or absence. But there are some patients you're probably going to pick up with the spectral Doppler. Um, you know, I, I really couldn't find any studies, though, of looking at how much it actually does increase your sensitivity and specificity with spectral Doppler. Um, and I found this study in Journal of Oxana Medicine entitled The Role of Spectral Doppler in the Evaluation of Partial Testicular Torsion. And they were talking about eight cases that they had where they quote unquote diagnosed the torsion by spectral sonography. But then if you read the paper more, seven of those actually had decreased flow on color Doppler. It was just obvious once they did spectral Doppler. So to be honest, I'm not really sure exactly how important this spectral Doppler thing is. I don't know how much it adds to our evaluation. I just couldn't find those studies. It's recommended by uh, those people that we talked about earlier, Blavis and Serzinski, who write the chapters on this. Uh, they all talk about it and they all recommend it. And so I'm sure it definitely adds something to the evaluation, but I'm just not sure how much. Unfortunately, I couldn't actually find that information to give to you. And just to drop that point home even more, this evaluation that they actually did, I read this paper in, and I really can't find any um, evidence that they used spectral Doppler when they did their evaluations, and they were pretty good, 35 out of the 36, and the 3 for 3 for torsion. This was back in the late 90s, and I'm not sure if they had spectral Doppler on their machines. If they did, they didn't report in their study that part in their methods. They just talked about looking at the flow, increased or decreased. Now, when they say increased or decreased, they could have been referring to spectral Doppler, but I just kind of got the feeling that they didn't. Um, we would love to hear from any of those authors if they actually do uh, remember that 13 years ago and if they were using spectral Doppler back then. So some quick pitfalls, some things that you definitely want to get right, how you can mess this up. First off, these these color settings that we've been talking about, uh, you can't just hit the color button and then be done and start looking at the testicles. Like we talked about, you want to go to the good one. You want to make sure that you've uh, adjusted your sensitivity uh, and your PRF and all that stuff so that you have good color flow in the good testicle first uh, so that you're not... Uh, you got to adjust your color gain too, right? Yes, exactly. And now and occasionally you're going to have a patient that is you're having a hard time getting flow in and so you can use the power Doppler as well. That is the setting that doesn't give you any directional information but who cares? I mean you don't really care all that much about directional information in the testicle. You just want to see if there's flow or not. So use the power Doppler. Um, don't hesitate to go to that if you need to. So what are you going to do? You're going to use this to rule out torsion, rule it in. What do you think about this literature that we've kind of talked about? I don't think we have the literature to suggest that we're capable of ruling this out yet. And I don't have. I'm I'm personally not not comfortable pulling pulling the trigger on ruling out. I think ruling in makes sense. Okay. No, I think those are those are very fair statements. Um, however. I thought about this question and I don't think I can kind of pin it down to you can rule it out, you can't rule it out, you can rule it in, you can't rule it out. So what I did is I kind of made an algorithm for myself. I kind of thought about how I use this because I do use it. I told you about a patient earlier that I did send home with antibiotics. I felt heterochitis. They did not get a radiology ultrasound. They did not get a urology console. So kind of I did rule it out on that patient. 
but I think it all depends on the patient. So this is my algorithm. There are other algorithms out there which are probably better, but you can take it or leave it. This is how I approach this patient. So I have an acute scrotum. I ultrasound them, of course. Um, I left that out here. I assume that you understood that. If they have decreased flow, then that's a torsion, uh, probable torsion. You send that patient to the OR. Call urology. You can attempt the manual detorsion then. Um, but they, even if you do detorsion, of course, they need to go to the OR. If they have increased or normal flow, that's when I'm whipping out the spectral Doppler on them. Uh, because it's not necessarily that they obviously have orchitis, epididymitis, or something else from increased to normal flow. Um, as we mentioned, they could have decreased venous flow when you do the spectral Doppler. If this is abnormal, then that's a possible torsion, and they probably need to go to the OR. However, if you do see a venous and an arterial waveform, then that's pretty good for ruling out torsion. I don't know exactly how good it is, so in that case, to be even more conservative and not just send that patient straight away home with orchitis, if it looked like the whole testicle was, was, had increased flow or epididymitis, if it was just epididymis, um, instead of just sending them home, what I would suggest there is you actually you treat according to your suspicion, depending on what you saw with the spectral Doppler and the normal color flow. Give them their antibiotics, give them their pain medicine, and then rescan them in 15 minutes. The reason I say this is something that we haven't talked about. There are reports of uh, this intermittent detorsion where you're going to have a patient, you've got the bell clapper deformity so the thing can just twist around on itself as it wants to. And if you could get, you get really unlucky, a patient comes in with a torsion and right before you scan them, they detorse and then you look and there's actually increased blood flow. And so th this has been reported, um, but it usually only lasts for less than 15 minutes. So that's why I say you rescan them. If all of a sudden what looked like orchitis and epididymitis with increased flow, all of a sudden the flow is normal now or just decreased from prior, then that's a possible torsion with this case of intermittent detorsion. However, if the testicle looks the same still after treating them, they're feeling better, you don't have any other, their pain's not going up, you scan them again and it's not decreased more from maybe it was just really really early early and they had a venous waveform I don't know if that exists or not I don't know if you can have pain and and still have your venous waveform on spectral but there's another reason to rescan them to see if anything's changed and if it's totally the same and you still think it's trochitis epididymitis then I mean I at least have sent these patients home in this case and I felt comfortable doing this you may not if you don't like this this algorithm I think it's totally appropriate to go with a very simple algorithm. I don't think you can throw, you don't need to throw testicular sound away because you think this is too complicated. I think it's totally reasonable to use this. Scan them. They have decreased flow send them to surgery. If it's normal or increased, then you send them radiology for their ultrasound and get a urology consult. You're not losing anything by using ultrasound and you could be gaining quite a bit. E even if you're not going to be ruling these out at all yourself, Ruling them in can make a big difference. This is definitely, we've said this over and over, this is a time-sensitive disease, and the patients that come in in the middle of the night, I mean, we have radiology techs in about 50% of the time if you look at the total hours in the day. So this could make a big difference when you have a tech coming in an hour later. I think this is reasonable, man. I mean, I think, obviously, decreased flow direct to surgery makes a lot of sense to me. I think the, the last algorithm that you showed those is definitely sort of interesting in this idea of doing a second uh, ultrasound to make sure that you're not looking at intermittent torsion. So I, I mean I think that I think I could maybe I think I can maybe pull the trigger on that and say that okay if there's decreased flow they're going to surgery. If there's increased flow and I've got a good spectral dop Doppler waveform then I'm basically gonna just assume that it's orchitis or epididymitis and then treat them while still repeating the scan again in 15 minutes and make sure that increased flow hasn't changed to no flow so they haven't intermittently torsed. And then if it's still increased, then there's not much to worry about if there's just increased flow and you know it's staying increased. That's pretty clearly orchitis or epididymitis. So that, that makes a lot of sense to me. I guess the place where I get a little more concerned if I, is if I don't get a good spectral Doppler waveform or if there's not a real big change in flow. 
I think normal is going to be the one that I'm going to have the most trouble with. You know what I'm saying? When I don't have mm-hmm. an actual diagnosis, the patient who has the same type of flow appearance in both testicles, those are the ones that I think I might have a little bit of pause with just dispositioning home. Yeah, exactly. And that's a great point. You don't have to, um, you can just totally lump those patients into urology consult and radiology performed ultrasound. That, that's not really a problem. You're still going to going to catch a very large percentage. I mean, the highest percentage of these scrotums is epididymitis. So you're going to see increased flow. I think that's going to be a very a minor percentage of your of your patients that are completely normal. Um, actually, that's not true. I shouldn't say that. That almost half of the patients in that study, 15 out of the 36, had normal um, ultrasound of the testicle. So it is going to be a fair percentage, but you're still going to be affecting care in over half of your patients. Yeah. If you, and if you and who knows, as we get better at this, as we do it more, we're going to get better at it. And as we send more people over to radiology to confirm our studies, we're going to feel more comfortable with our findings. So, <clears throat> you know, I mean, like with everything else in ultrasound, the more you do it, the better you get at it, the more comfortable you are making your own decisions. So, you know, I think if we, just like with appendicitis, if we put forth the effort to actually do this scan and get better at it, then we'll be a little bit more comfortable making these disposition decisions and nothing is black and white Uh, you could totally use these two algorithms as a day algorithm where it's really easy and quick to get a radiology ultrasound and urology consult and a night algorithm where it's going to take hours to get that done why not scan them a couple times treat them and if they get better you may feel good sending them home so you can use these algorithms any way you feel appropriate in your practice this is not a black and white thing the the downside of not having a lot of literature is you, we don't have a lot of literature, but kind of the upside is a smart physician like yourself can kind of use the the, the skills that they have and, and the resources at their disposal to come up with the best treatment for, for your patient in that situation. So at least we can roll it in, right, and get the urologist to come in in their speedy car and take this patient to the OR, and maybe we can do more. So hopefully all that made sense to you all. Hopefully you got something out of it. Um, If it didn't, if you thought it was total crap and a total waste of your time, then we have a gift for you, um, a testicle in a cup. So enjoy (laughs) either your testicle in a cup or the new information and skills that you've gained from this from this, this podcast. And Serzinski, Blavis, any of you guys who have been doing this for 15 years, we would love to hear any comments you have. You can add this, add it in later and give people your tips. All right. Thanks, everybody. So that's our uh, testicular ultrasound for the emergency ultrasound podcast. And uh, we'll be talking to you soon. All right. Go scan some scrotums.
you're not good enough at ultrasound, that's not an excuse to punish your patients with radiation. Get out there, ultrasound some hearts, some lungs, some IVCs, let us know how you feel about it.